Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Barber Queer episode four? Five. Five. Now it's a full on orgy. Uh, my name is Jay Northcott. I am Alexander Jamal, aka Big Daddy J, aka the best Virgo that ever existed. Except for me. Dead. Okay. <laughs> Forget it. Next, next week. And I'm Cameron Chase, I guess, special guest. Special guest. <laughs> bam, bam, bam. Let, let's just let's just have a moment of silence for J Ho. He he died in a tragic, a very, very tragic douching accident. He uh, douched with, uh, he thought it was water, but it was acid. And See, I heard that he went with the Trump suggestion and put bleach up his butt and oh. then put a light to it. Oh, shit. And you know what? I don't know her. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, J-Ho went on vacation and doesn't really care about us. So just kidding. We're sending all the love and hopefully they're having a great time um, vacationing. Um, this week, we have a pretty hefty topic that's going to be pretty fun and pretty cool to chat about. Um, we are chatting about HIV and AIDS. Um, so we're going to start off with our little icebreaker of the week. Which is Pulse Check. Um, so basically what Pulse Check is, I learned this when I used to do like social working for like youth in troubled areas. Um, it's when you just come together, you have kind of like a panel discussion and you just state where you are, where you are today. Like, how are you feeling? Where's your mindset at? You have no obligation to elaborate. Um, if you want to elaborate, feel free to elaborate. But the point is just tell us where you are at today. And then from there, I want you to tell us what your goals and expectations are for today's conversation. So what do you hope to give and what do you hope to take from this conversation today? Either of you guys can go first. Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling fresh. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm excited to be here and like talk about this. And I hope that this conversation, especially like sharing my experiences, will come through and, you know what, entertain people, but also like help people and, and um, get people to get checked and know their status and, you know, break this or smash the stigma, as people say. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I am doing uh, lovely today. Um, I have been sleeping in a lot, which has been nice. Um, I am going to, I've been planning for a three-way for the past two weeks that might happen this week. So it'll be my first three-way. So that's kind of exciting. <laughs> first three-way. First three-way. The um, fact that you're planning it's too much for me. I'm a Virgo. I can't stop myself. <laughs> um, and uh, what I hope to bring to this conversation is uh, like I work in equity, diversity, and inclusion. And, and I like to get rid of as many stigmas as we can. I like to curb stomp those bitches. And, uh, and I really hope to gain some knowledge from both of you amazing humans that we have in this room today cool um i would say my pulse check would be uh, i would say my day has been insightful and i say that because for the past month i've kind of just been on a journey of like finding myself kind of accepting my truth um and i think the one truth that just just to kind of just go deeper in one truth that I've learned about my, well, I've always knew it, but I've never accepted it. And I've always, I've always challenged when people would say it to me is that I'm very argumentative. <laughs> so that's been my, my, my thing of the week, addressing why I'm argumentative, addressing why people think I'm argumentative and seeing how I can go about changing that. So today would be insightful. Yeah. And, and do we want to do a quick address of just saying that we had a little bit of a disagreement last week, but we had a great conversation. I was on the lake and I don't know where you were, but you were somewhere. We had a great chat about how, um, how to continue the work that we're doing on Barber Queer and also still fight, but have fun. Mm -hmm. And with that, we should note that if, if there was anything that was said that was offensive to anybody, it wasn't meant to be offensive. And the, the purpose of this podcast is to have those conversations that are difficult to have. So there are going to come times, and I can guarantee it, that we're going to say things that people are not going to want to hear. And unfortunately enough, that's the purpose of this podcast. And yeah, we're, we're, our goal is not to offend. Our goal is to educate and to provide some insight going forward to the LGBTQ plus community. So again, if you were offended, I apologize. 
Jay, I think you apologize. Yeah, I will apologize as well. And also, if you want to leave any comments, just on Apple on Apple Podcasts, you can rate us five stars and then comment whatever you feel. Why Apple? What about Spotify? I don't think you can rate rate on Spotify. Oh, yeah, I don't think you can either. Yeah. I know that's unfortunate. Okay, do we want to get to the topic? Oh, well, we didn't say. Well, okay, wait. We we have to go back around because okay. I, I want to know what what. What are our goals and expectations? What do you hope to give and to achieve? I, I'm not sure. Maybe you guys said that, but I definitely didn't say it. Um, my goal was, my goal was like, like unpacking stigma and, uh, learning from the two of you. Okay. Cameron. Yeah. I said that I wanted to have, um, you know, have my story hopefully help people or, or, and get, um, get through the importance of, of getting tested regularly Mm -hmm. and knowing your status and yeah honestly like i've had this point where talking about this issue is such a it's such a second nature now Mm -hmm. and i i think i can really break my story down in a way that is like insightful but also not necessarily scary i think a lot of people assume that like you know living with HIV is very scary and i i don't think it is anymore so i'm I'm really excited to kind of just give insight into that nice i love that what i hope to achieve is is i hope to I hope to educate those that weren't fortunate enough or haven't put in the effort or time to receive the education that is that around something that is so common in today's day and age. Um, I hope to make people that were uncomfortable to have this conversation a little bit more comfortable, make them realize that we're talking about something that is very common in our community and that there, there is no issues talking about, things that you are uncomfortable about. Let's just be mm-hmm. open. It's 2020. Like what, what, what the fuck are we hiding behind our panties for? Right. Work. Yeah. Love it. Um, do we want to go to our fun facts of H- oh. HIV? I forgot. We have a fun, are there facts. fun facts. Well, I, I don't know if you could call it a fun <laughs> facts section, but like a, a, a facts section that is, that is cute. Uh, and educational. Okay. <laughs> Fun facts. So the first one that I had was that at one point in time, if you were an HIV positive immigrant or person trying to migrate to the United States, you cannot enter or apply for, or apply for immigrancy in the United States of America. This was abolished by President Obama. And I want to say 2011. I'm scrolling through my phone and it's Obama. too much to read Me at this point. Too. Um, yeah. So for me, that's a fun fact. I didn't know that. I didn't know that for one, we, we barred people from, or not we, but they barred people from entering their country strictly because of their status. But the reason, according to this article in New York Times, is that the reason why they did that is because they didn't know a lot about HIV at the time. And it was when HIV was like at its most predominant and like, when it was the, when a new disease, so that in order for them to try to try to, I guess, control the disease and the outbreak and was the for them, yeah, yeah to, to not allow people to come back into the country. So I just found it very interesting that this was something that existed till 2011, or at least until Obama era, right? Well, just going off that really quickly, I find that like, I'm surprised, but I'm also not because like, with COVID happening right now with a disease that we don't, or with a virus that we don't really know much about, we also have like barred Americans from coming through the border here. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm like surprised, but I'm also, when I'm thinking about what's happening now, I'm like, I'm also not that shocked because Mm -hmm. you're trying to keep your country, uh, you know, whatever you agree with or not, it's like, ultimately they're trying to keep their country safe, quote unquote. Right. Um, And that's sort of what's happening right now here. Mm -hmm. So like, yes, it is discriminatory, but also like, if you don't know anything about it and, you know, granted this was 30 something years ago, it, I, I'm not shocked mm-hmm. that it happened. Like I was surprised when I heard the fact and then now thinking about it, I'm like, no, that like something not similar, but similar ish is happening right now with COVID-19. Yeah. And there's a, uh, I was just listening to a podcast called, uh, still processing with these two uh, writers from the New York times. And they have a really good comparison between the HIV crisis and Corona crisis that's mm-hmm. happening. And I was like, very intrigued by like just the conversations that we're having and having and kind of like how there were so many people that are just saying like, you're killing us. Like you're continuing to kill us by not giving us these medications and not mm-hmm. doing this stuff. And that the government right now in the U S is kind of doing very similar things. of just like, 
killing a lot of people by not putting the the right precautions. Silence right? is death. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I completely agree. I think the only I think the only thing that makes it such a wild thought to me is the fact that this remains in effect until Obama era. Agreed. Um, before I put my phone down, I had read that when Obama first became president in two thousand and eight, they tried to re- repeal the, the the bill, and it was denied, or it still existed until two thousand and eleven. So. For me, I'm like, it wasn't 2008 nor 2011 that we really figured out what HIV was. So why are we still banning people from entering the country? Like, imagine, imagine if going forward, 2035, we're like, well, Corona once existed, so you can't come into our country. It's like, it's it's fucked, right? America. 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 (laughs) America. (laughs) Um, Wait, wait, what did did Clinton say again? Um, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Just saying. Exactly. <laughs> that was really great. That was really great. Are you a Bill Clinton impersonator? I could be if you want yeah. me to be. If it, if, it, if it turns you on. Are you Hillary? Do you do Hillary? No, I don't do any impersonations. I'm an actor that does zero impersonations. I'm... You can. What's her name again? Miss, Miss, Miss BJ? BJ. Blowjob? Yeah. That game Monica off. Lewinsky? There we go. Oh my God. <laughs> Miss BJ. <laughs> Oh my God. Monica is not happy. You and also Monica is an amazing speaker. Is she? Oh my God. So she's now, she does like Ted talks now. Okay. She's incredible. She talks about how she essentially was the first person in the age of internet to be like cyber bullied for. And she when was. you think about it, you're like, wow, she gave somebody a blow job and she got called like slut whore, mm-hmm. lost her job, became ostracized, and he got to continue on being president. Mm-hmm. Stupid. It's insane. Male privilege. Highly recommend her TED Talk. It's okay. incredible. She's hilarious as shit. Oh, Check it out. Um, did, what was that fun fact that you were talking about about glory holes? I don't think it has anything to do with HIV, oh. but it has to do with, uh, with okay. um, the pandemic. The pandemic. <laughs> so, in BC right now, on the Center for Disease and Control website, um, they recommend uh, steps to protect yourself during sex. One of them says, like, wear a face mask. Heavy breathing during sex, sex can create more droplets that may transmit COVID-19. Then one of them says, use barriers like walls. <laughs> Example, glory holes. <laughs> <laughs> so in during this pandemic, if anybody needs to have some real good sex, just find a glory hole. You're safe. Wear a mask and get get what you need get like should we have gotten on the train of like being entrepreneurs and cutting out like little like portable glory holes you can bring <laughs> to like a hookup so you can wear your mask yeah. you wear your gloves and then you just put this board <laughs> over yourself we actually have glory <laughs> holes right in front of us right now the mics are just sticking through glory holes we actually i mean there's something very phallic about this yeah <laughs> i know you're like oh <laughs> This is right in your face. It does make this podcast even gayer and gayer. <laughs> um, okay, let's go back to where we are here. So, um, how do you uh, how do you feel about uh, the knowledge and education that we have on HIV, and how do you feel about ensuring that people get the proper knowledge? Um, I'll go first. I feel like. I feel like as a Canadian, at least, I feel like our school system has done a very good job at ensuring that we know the difference. We know what HIV is, what AIDS is, things like that. I feel like for some reason, we are still ignorant minded. Um, we have all the tools. Let's say, for example, you can go to a sex clinic to get tested and there are more than enough flyers or posters listed around educating you on the differences on the likelihood or what, which activities are going to, or are more likely to put you at risk and things like that. But for some reason we ignore them. And I think we ignore them out of fear. Mm. Um, So I like to think that the education has been provided to us, if not by our educational systems, by like nonprofits, things like that. I think that's something that we as Canadians, or at least we as Torontonians do really well. We, we have these nonprofits and we have these, these third party sources to provide this information. I think that we need to do better at ensuring that we actually latch on to this information and take this Mm -hmm. information in and digest this information. Yeah. I feel actually sort of the opposite. I think that there is a lot of, education, like you said, like in sex clinics and and within the community in Toronto, I think the disconnect and Amy granted, this may be different in, in Ontario. I grew up in BC. The disconnect is 
they should be teaching this in high school, I think. And I did not receive any of that. No, is there any sex education in high school? I think it's, I got oh it. Oh my God. It's the worst. Yeah. I think I got it in, jun- in junior high. I don't think I got it in like grade 10, 11 and 12. Yeah. We watched the miracle of life video and that's <laughs> quite literally the only sex that I remember oh, I'm getting. Con- I'm confused. By uh, junior high, what do you mean? Middle school? Uh, grade six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, so you're oh, you, got it, you got it younger and not older. Yeah, I didn't get a great channel oh, okay. of 12. See, I got the Miracle of Life video in the fifth grade, and I don't remember getting anything up until I graduated. Huh. See, I had it also in junior high, quote, yeah. what we called it middle school. Um, and then in high school, we would have fitness slash health. So half the year it was fitness, and then half the year it was health. Mm. Oh. Mm. That's... Oh God, school is just bizarre. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I find that like, sometimes they were like, they were teaching you things that like, uh, almost it, for me anyway, I felt like sometimes like stigmatizing these things, but like, if you get any of these, like, I remember when I first got chlamydia and I thought that my whole life was, ru- I was like, this is, Same. I was like, this is it. I'm a whore. I'm the most disgusting person in the entire world. But then I was like, Oh, this is like a very, very, very common thing to happen to people. Oh my God. Get this. So the first time I got chlamydia, I was about to go away traveling and I had called a friend saying that I, had chlamydia and I was, this is when I still lived with my parents. And to this day, I don't necessarily know if they heard, but literally I said, I have chlamydia and my dad opened my door and went dinner's ready. And then went, uh, uh, (laughs) uh, and like backed out. And then I came back like a year later and I had the bottle of the pills and it was empty, but I guess I had fallen to like the side of the bed and it was like on my pillow. Oh, I came no. back. <laughs> but I mean, also, it's at the same time, I also had to tell my parents I'm HIV positive. So it's, yeah. at the same like, time, it's, it's like a good icebreaker. It was like a good icebreaker. It's like, well, mom and dad, now you know I'm having sex. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any knowledge that you think, uh, any knowledge or um, things that you think people don't know enough about right now in our regular day of just like being queers in the, in the city of Toronto? I think you equals you. I know it's a huge campaign and it, it, I understand. And there's a lot of people who do, but I think a lot of people can't wrap their mind around the concept that undetectable equals untransmittable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because when you start going into really, um, you know, very scientific and you're you're going, you're giving these words that not necessarily people, they, they don't necessarily understand. So for me, like, especially to my friends who are straight and don't necessarily deal with this or, you know, they're in their monogamous relationships, mm-hmm. they're like getting married and shit. Um, I say to them, I'm like, it's like I'm in remission. And right. they can understand that because cancer has been pushed on us, like in terms of we cancer's touched all of us since we've, you know, been alive. For sure. And so people understand when you relate it to something like that. So I know it's not the exact same thing as being in remission, but I think when I say, you know, this medication puts me into remission, I can't pass it on. I can't do, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm not going to die. I'm going to live a long, healthy life. Then they are able to understand better than me saying on you equals you. And they're like, the fuck does that mean? Right. Which I get, I understand people need to have things broken down in a way that with, with, almost with words that are familiar to them, which is Mm -hmm. why I use the cancer analogy, because a lot of people, more often than not, most people have been, have dealt with cancer in some form of another, whether it be a family member or a friend or whatnot. So being able to say I'm in remission Mm -hmm. gives them peace of mind and gets them to, to understand what you're talking about, even though they aren't the same thing. Right. And I think this like undetectable, untransmittable thing seems quite new. Mm -hmm. Um, for, from my knowledge, it's like, like how many, do you know how many years? I don't necessarily know how many years, but I know like being on, um, antiretrovirals, Mm -hmm. they are the things that make you undetectable. I know antiretrovirals have, uh, antiretrovirals have been around since the late eighties. Right. So I don't necessarily know if that made them undetectable, but I at least know since at least the mid nineties, right. Um, I'm fairly certain has been, you can be undetectable, but back then it was like, you had to take like 20 pills a day yeah, and every like four hours. Yeah. yeah. And now it's simply one pill and soon, hopefully, um, there has been a lot of tests in the last few months. It's going to be injections. Hmm like a once a month injection, maybe, mm. you know, I think it'll probably get to like once a year. Cause they also just, I know this is like a tangent, but they also just, um, released that somebody was cured of mm-hmm. HIV for the first time, not getting a bone marrow transplant or a stem cell oh, wow. um, implant. So it, this person was treated simply by medication, which is huge. It, 
they did say they have to get it verified by like third party doctors and whatnot. But the fact that it was reported in the New York Times and Los Angeles Times, like that means it's at least somewhat it's on the right path. Yeah. And and that's crazy because like, I feel like, I feel like I've been so like, even since like, like, I feel like people have been able to be undetectable and untransmittable since I've been having sex, mm-hmm. but I didn't really know about any of that stuff until maybe two or three years ago that I was like, if I have sex with somebody that's HIV positive and taking medication properly and those kind of things, I'm like fine, you know? And that's, and, and it's, it's, those are the kind of things that I wish I would have known, especially been being younger and things that I don't think we actually teach a lot in school of like gay mm. sexual health. Like we don't really talk about gay sexual health because no. like no straight people want to sit there and listen to it, even though I have to watch a baby come out of a vagina and I'm never going to do that. <laughs> and and what, what's interesting is like, you know, especially after becoming positive, like, I thought back on things and it was like, oh, there were definitely people that I like wouldn't go out with because they had HIV. And that was only, you know, five years prior. Yeah. I'm I'm glad that before I got my diagnosis, I had actually become quite educated on it. So when I did find out, it wasn't like it was I, I immediately went into like fight or flight, but I was like, okay, I know this. I'm not gonna die. I know like what's happening. Um but it's still like, it makes you think back and you're like, wow, I was an asshole to that person. And you know, it takes being in their shoes to, to realize that. And so that's what I'm really trying to do with, with, especially with a lot of the work I've been doing and a lot of like the the talks I do. And I'm really just trying to, to show that there is nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And like, you know what, you were dealt a shitty hand and that's, you know, we live and we, Mm -hmm. we get it. And like, for me, it was like, okay, this is shitty, but it's also the best thing that's happened to me. Why it was the best it? and worst thing to happen. I, I wouldn't say shitty. Only because what's the difference from you and someone who's diabetic? Very true. You are, you are dealt a hand. I, yes. I'll say, well, we were dealt a hand, but also it's interesting because when, especially as queer people growing up, all we really hear is like, you're going to get AIDS and you're yeah, going to die. Right. So it, that's what, that's basically like, yeah. especially growing up in an extremely religious household, it, there was like that voice in the back of my head that was like, it's, it's a fear. This is what, yeah. this is what yeah. you were warned about. It's, it's like, the worst thing that could ever happen. It's every <laughs> queer ma- male's fear. But one thing I want to ask you, and this is just me asking for my own knowledge. Mm. If you are undetectable, is it a hundred percent sure that you will not transmit or yes according to the cdc it's 100 percent. 100 you cannot literally yeah not even nine there is no nine. there is no chance of passing it on yeah it basically lives dormant in my kidney yeah which i'm like just give me a kidney transplant like oh my god <laughs> just, pull it out. just rip <laughs> it out girl in that situation too there there are often times where you will test for hiv and come out negative yeah so basically undetectable means that if you were to get tested for hiv it comes back like now you're you're fine. So now my question. Okay, so on that, how do they know that you still have HIV? Because they look for certain. So basically, it comes back as negative, but they go deeper in okay. the in the test. So it does show that there's still the trace of it there, but it's so little, it's impossible to pass it on. Because how do I describe it? So like, there's a certain number of copies per milliliter of blood of the okay. virus. So basically, if you are really positive and you don't know that you're positive and you get it from somebody it's um the reason it passes on so fast is because there's so many copies per so you know like during anal there can be tearing and whatnot that's usually how it like passes so with that you get so many copies per milliliter of blood that you will contract contract it versus i think if there's something like at somebody who's very very sick has like thousands of copies per per um, milliliter and somebody who's undetectable has less than 10 Mm -hmm. copies of the virus, which is, it's too little for it to replicate. Right. And uh, I guess for, I guess for both of you, like what, like when dating or going on dates with people, I feel like uh, two weeks ago when we were talking, I talked a little bit about a person who I met on Grindr who was uh, HIV positive and undetectable. And uh, they were like, let's have bareback sex. And I was wasted because I only am really on Grindr at 2 a.m. when I'm wasted. And I was like, oh, maybe. And then I was like, actually, I'm fucking tired. And uh, I think he got like a tiny bit upset that I was like saying because it was, um, he was HIV positive and he told me, but I was like, I think it's just because I'm tired. But I did have the thought in my head being like, 
even though he's undetectable. And I know that that means it can't be transmitted. Like, do I feel comfortable having bareback sex with a stranger? And then also I'm like, I fucking got chlamydia twice when I moved to Toronto. So I don't know what I do. I don't know who the dirty men that I keep fucking Mm -hmm. hanging out with are. But I'm like, I don't know what my issue is because I come from a trailer park. But every time I like get this chlamydia and I was like, okay, now I'm just going to make sure they use condoms for, for a while, you know, just like make sure that I'm using condoms. Hey, 2020 is like mask, gloves, condoms, <laughs> yes. and socks. Yeah. And <laughs> MGC. Yeah. Mask, glove, condom. No masks, um, no gloves, no condoms, no sex. So what was the question? Like if we, if we are comfortable with having sex with someone that's... Yeah. Or like, or like, uh, have you been in those situations or what, what kind of conversations have you had around those things? Okay. So I have twice in my life. Um, once when I lived in Detroit, um, there was this one boy who I was like, mad head over heels for um we never dated but we like we fucked once Mm -hmm. um he and i fucked with the condom that like i was a little bit nervous after the fact um but at the same time like i've always been the kind of person to educate myself on whatever the fuck i'm doing right do i mean i can sit here and i can mow my lawn before I go mow my lawn, I'm going to watch 25 YouTube videos on how to mow my lawn and it will come out <laughs> looking like Edward Scissorhands did it. Like, <laughs> I kid you not. Like I'm that guy, right? Um, even with my dog, like I'm watching YouTube videos every day on how to train the bitch on shit that she's already trained on, right? I'm like, yeah. this is just me. Um, yeah. So I was a little bit nervous, but at the same time, I wasn't. Now, fast forward to about, I want to say a year ago, I dated this boy in Buffalo who I've known for years. Um, we've always been attracted to each other, kind of flirted along the years, but like never actually went somewhere until I went to Buffalo not too long ago and we met up and then we started dating. Um, he's HIV positive and it was kind of just like, it is what it is. I'm like, for one, I'm on prep, like I'm educated. He was undetectable. So it was just like, you know, we're going to fuck and we're going to fuck and we're going to fucking not care. Yeah. Right. So like, I didn't care that much. And I think the only difference with me and somebody else is, is the fact that I take the amount of time to educate myself on things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I don't allow myself to get wrapped up in, in what is it called? WebMD. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the one, the, the guy that, the guy from Grindr, the one thing that he said that I thought was really beautiful is that he was like, I'm never coming out to hurt people. I'm not going to try to have sex with somebody if I'm HIV positive and hurt them. You know, like that's not the point of like, I'm undetectable and saying these things because I hope that you can trust me to know that I'm not trying to hurt you. That's not, that's not the intention of us having sex. Oh, hearing that makes me so sad. Yeah. <laughs> and I've, I've definitely been in that position yeah. before. And it, it's one of those things where it's like, well, do I have to validate my existence or my, my reality to make you want to have sex with me? It's mm-hmm. just so, it, it seems so, it's, it's preposterous when you like say it, but also like, that's just the reality that a lot of us face. And yeah. I mean, for me, it's like, I, I thankfully have sort of the ability to be like, Oh, okay. You think that I definitely don't want to like have sex with you. Right. But at the same time, <laughs> it's like, uh, there's people who will take that very, very personally because like, I mean, I'm very lucky to have a great support system and um, so many mm-hmm. people don't. And that is the big difference. Yeah. And I think the craziest thing was like when I came out quite publicly, um, the amount of people that I am friends with that I know at like a pretty like good level mm-hmm came out to me and was like, we wish we were as brave as you. We also wow. are HIV positive. And that floored me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like absolutely floored me. And that got me being like, okay, so, you know, educating people is, is a very good thing. But also like, if this was just so, if we could break down the stigma of this, mm-hmm. you wouldn't have these people feeling like they're so alone in something and that they can't even talk to their friends about it. For like, sure. It's so, it's so crazy for me to think about that. But at the same time, like that's why I'm doing this podcast. That's why I'm like, I've been doing like speaking things throughout the, I mean, pre COVID, yeah. but like <laughs> throughout that. And it was just very, it, I feel like being public, like, yes, it's going to sort of be an interesting thing in my life, mm-hmm. but also like, I now know it's like for a really good cause and for yeah. a really good reason. 
Yeah, I think one of the one things that I that I always try to preface to people is people saying like, I just hope that the person I'm going to sleep with is clean. And then by saying those things just like perpetuates the idea of like, of like that having yeah. HIV or having, and I think I used the word dirty earlier, but the, in that way, I meant just like gross boys that don't take care of themselves <laughs> and are like just actively out to get chlamydia. Um, <laughs> but uh, like the, the idea of people saying like that, that somebody who has HIV is dirty is like such a gross statement to you. And you know what? I've definitely said that like, yeah, maybe 2013, sure. 14. I definitely said that. Did and you say that they were dirty though? No, no, no. I would say like, are you clean? And right. it's like, and it's so now being on the other side of it. And actually it took somebody who was HIV positive to say like, this is why that's offensive. And I was like, oh, and I didn't really mm -hmm. ever think of that. And now being on the other side of it, I'm like, okay. Yeah. Hold, that, on. hold the phone. Yeah. Is that an offensive term? Uh, yeah. I mean, I find it a little like... It's just, I it's did, very, I like up until like two seconds ago, I had no idea that was a thing. Yeah. Like the way it is, is it's like, okay. So you're saying to somebody like, are you clean of like HIV? No, it makes sense. And then it's like the opposite's dirty. Yeah. And it's, and it makes people feel just very like, oh, like mm -hmm. even if you've like dealt with it yourself and you're like, no, I'm not like, this is just part of my life. It still brings apart such a stigma of like where we were in like the eighties and nineties. Yeah. And so there are a lot of people who have been really trying to get that out of the sort of gay cultural zeitgeist is like, get that out because it just, it, it makes it sound like you have like you're dirty. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's yeah. like when people had, um, you know, before they had the, the, um, pills for, uh, oh my gosh, what am I, what is the word I'm thinking of? Perhaps? Syphilis. Syphilis. Yeah. <laughs> Where, you know, you couldn't sleep with any, like if you had syphilis, you were going to die from syphilis. Yes. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's sort of a simple thing like that where it's like, okay, well you can take a pill for that and you'll be fine. Same with you take a pill for HIV and you're, you're good. Yeah. So to hear somebody say like, are you clean? And then you're like, well, I have HIV and they're like, uh, right. yeah. <laughs> it's so, it's so, and you know what, to each their own, like things differ, but like at the same time, like speaking from my experience, like if somebody would say that to me, I would probably just say, like, try to educate them and be like, this yeah. is why you probably shouldn't say that. What is the way that you should ask if like, let's say it doesn't say their status on their, on their, uh, grinder profile or on their Tinder or whatever. Mm -hmm. What do you think the appropriate way is of saying like, um, are you HIV positive? I think that's probably, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that, that's the way. <laughs> I mean, I think there's people when they, you know, you'll say your, your preferences and you're like, I'm, you know, somebody says to you, like, I'm HIV negative. Yeah. I think it's that person's responsibility to at least say like, you know, I'm positive undetectable. Right. But I also think, and I get why people don't put it in their profiles because it, it can be, some people are just not ready for that. For sure. Um, but also at the same time, like, if somebody says to you, like, I'm HIV negative, you should definitely like respond honestly right. and be very, um, you know, if they're, if they're not educated on it, be prepared to send them a bunch of, <laughs> yeah. a bunch of links. So you just have them like, like, uh, bookmarked in your, in your. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what I look at it as is like, if somebody, you know, is like not going to sleep with me because of my status, yeah, I'm still going to send them for sure the stuff because it's like, okay, maybe, we are, this isn't going to be like a sexual thing, but I can at least hope that you'll read this and just get a bit more educated on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going into, uh, like what happens when you go into the, you go into the, um, the hassle free clinic or whatever clinic you go into, you do a test. And I remember the first time I ever got tested, which weirdly enough was when I was 25 years old. So a year ago was the very first time I ever got HIV tested. Oh my God, you're a baby. Wow. Um, it was because I only ever had sex with the same with like three partners before then. And I was like, I don't really need to, which was just silly. Um, because you should still always get tested. Um, because you never know when you just go to a club and have sex with a random human and you don't know. Amen. Um, but I remember the very first time I did it, I like sat there and they prick your little finger with the HIV thingy that's in a little like round thing. And then it says one red dot or two red dots will show up. If two show up, you're HIV positive. And if one shows up and I remember sitting there with this guy, they're just like staring at me. And I was like, Oh my God, this is the guy that I'm going to have to be like in the same room with when I find something out. That's such big news. Um, but did you get the question? So before, every time I've done it, even like I, I, I go to the same clinic every time, yeah. but 
they consistently give me that questionnaire of, so what are you going to do? Right? Like, do you think you'd be suicidal? All that stuff. And I'm like, well, what comes to my mind is just me, me being the devil's advocate that I am. I'm like, well, if I wasn't suicidal, the fact that you just put that in my head, maybe now I'm going <laughs> to fucking kill myself. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, 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 what? Like, I don't know. I, Honestly, doctors have sometimes the worst bedside manner. The worst. Like, but the thing the is, they ha- they have to ask because God forbid you go in there and you're depressed. It's like this is just gonna be the icing on the cake for you, right? So, if, for them, that's just a manner of doing their due dil- due diligence. Yeah, know? whatever that thing. They're like, they're like, oh, they're scouts on mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Okay, keep going. Go. Um. So I, I guess I guess my question is is um. How did you find out? What was, what was the, how did it happen? Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm going to try to shrink this to like a way smaller drama than it was, but, um, essentially like it would have been actually, what date is it today? Like almost exactly three years ago today, um, that I was actually away for work. I was working at a marketing agency. We were at a music festival Mm -hmm. setting up, um, for the week. And on the first day I got there and I was like, I feel really weird. And, I couldn't figure out what it was. And I honest to God thought it was because there was so much fresh air. We were in like <laughs> Oro Medante. And I thought it was because I'd been in the city so long and was getting fresh air and all this sun. And I was like, oh, this is probably just why I feel really weird. By the night, I was like hallucinating. I mm. had like, I was not in my right mind. I worked for three more days. We had already got, you know, our wristbands for the festival, our hotels booked, all this stuff to actually enjoy after we'd set up. Right. And then you know, I got sent home, essentially. They let me drive the rental car in like a fever dream, but like I drove back three hours and was like, okay, I'm going to sleep this off for one night and then I'm going to be back and we're going to party all weekend. It's going to be great. Um, I did not get up essentially for like three and a half weeks. Like I was on my couch. It was to the point where I was so tired. I had a friend who would come and take me to get, I had almost a hundred vials of blood taken over the course of three weeks. They were testing me for everything. Mm -hmm. And um, my friend would come over and I would have to like, the the blood place was only maybe like 400 meters from my apartment. Right. And I could not walk. I had to be like lifted and like basically hold on to somebody. And I would sleep for 24 hours at a time. It was fucking insane. And I was diagnosed with mono. So hmm. basically, and I was like, oh, this makes all the sense in the world. Like right. I'm so exhausted. Didn't end up really, I went back to work for a few days and my contract ended. And I basically was like, it took me like six months to just like get my energy back. It was Mm. so bad. And I was like, of course, this is mono. So during that time, I'm not like having sex with anybody really. Like um, I was so exhausted all the time and I was constantly getting sick. I had the flu four times between August and January. Wow. And then by like February 2018, I was like, oh my God, I can't even get out of bed without having to take like 40 pills to just like function. Right. And finally was like, I'll get a GP. And you know, this is probably just an after effect of mono. Went in when I finally got a GP and she sat me down. She's like, okay, you want to go on prep? Awesome. Like you have to do all these tests. Did the tests. Went, um, got a call from the doctor and like, you need to come in today. And I was like, what? And they're like, can you come in today? And I was like, I can come in in the next hour. And they're like, okay, you can come in. So I came in and I, it, HIV never even crossed my mind because right. they told me mono and I wasn't sleeping with anybody. Mm. I was so tired. I thought she was going to tell me I had cancer. So I was very like in that mindset. And she was like, unfortunately, you are HIV positive. And I was like, oh, that, mm. that's it. I went into this like weird fight or flight Mm. mode and I was like, I thought you were going to tell me I had cancer stage four. And she then was like, um, you know, the medication's very, very expensive. And I was like, Oh God. And she was like, I think it was something like $2,000 a month. And this weird thing like happened where like, you know how, when you have this, like when you hear about people having like near death experiences, things like flash. Yeah. I had this whole like flash in my head where I was like, you know what? I'm young, but like, I made a list in high school of everything I wanted to achieve by the time I was 30 and I've achieved that. And so if this is going to be the end, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. And she was like, so we'll obviously get the medication if you can't afford it. And I was like, oh, never mind. I just got, <laughs> We're like, in Canada, right. I just got off that train really quickly. But um, it was strange because she was like, well, what are you doing tonight? I was like, I have friends coming over for dinner. And she's like, keep that. 
yeah. do that. If you want to tell them, tell them. And I was like, I mean, they're coming over in half an hour. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> There's obviously going to know something's wrong. And she gave me a hug and was like, I'm now your doctor for this for at least oh. the next while. And she's like, is there anything you need? Like, can I do anything? And I looked at her and I was like, you can do your job and get me better. Yeah. And she was like, okay, we're going to do that. And the next week I got a call and they're like, you need to come in right now. And I was like, oh God, now they're going to tell me I have cancer on top of this. So I go in and they're like, your CD4 count. So for those of you who don't know, CD4 is essentially your... Um, your immune system. So somebody mm -hmm. who's extremely healthy without HIV is probably within the 1000 to 1500 range. And 200, if you drop to 200 C4, um, that's when they diagnose you with AIDS. I was mm -hmm. at 230. Wow. And that like put a whole weird thing in my head where I was like, Oh fuck. She's like, we have to get you on medication today. We cannot wait to figure out what medication works for you. We're going to just, you know, give you Gen Boya. Best, yeah. And I was like, okay. So I went on it. Um, there were some weird ass side effects. Oh my God. Um, but it was, it was interesting because for that point, I was like, I'm educated on this. I can, I can deal with this. I will, I will, you know, move on, do my thing, not realizing that I had like just kind of suppressed everything. Right. And one of the things they recommended I do was go off my anti-anxiety medication because that tends to bring your heart rate down while there's so many boosters in the medication that kind of like boost it up. So they're like, we think you should go off this for a bit. If you're having like a little bit of anxiety, we can try to get you back on, but you should really only be on this one medication. So I said, okay. Um, and I went off it and I had been on anti-anxiety medication for like seven years. Right. And so... I suddenly was like feeling amazing. I was like, oh, I didn't know how foggy I was. This is wonderful. I feel like 100% not realizing I suddenly didn't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress yeah. and anxiety. And I ended up like, I worked for this really amazing company, but I ended up having like a complete nervous breakdown where I went to Cam H, the mental hospital. And I was like, I need help. And they were like, are you suicidal? And I said, no. And they're like, then you don't need to be here. And I was like, oh right. God, I don't know where I'm supposed to go. Uh, and I was so just, and, and honestly, therapy saved my life. Like it, it absolutely saved my life. I now I'm still not on the medication. I am very just, I've hit this point now where I'm like, you know what? I have had all this, 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 and this happened to me. And if mm -hmm. I can deal with that, I can deal with, with other things. So I've, I've now have the tools to deal with it. And I very much understand that some people do need that medication and who's to say that I won't need it eventually in the, in the future. But for now, it's so, I feel clear, but also have the ability to deal with just whatever life throws versus, you know, not having that <laughs> for sure i had a i had a lady one time in, in lethbridge alberta if anybody knows what oh lethbridge. Like very very southern uh alberta and alberta canada and uh she said this thing to me she's like you know like because i i was on uh, add medication she was like you know it's like if you have diabetes it's you know they have to take medication and they have to take insulin every day that's the same thing for you Mm -hmm. And so I had that in my head for a really long time that I needed this ADD medication to function in the day when in all reality, sometimes you like, I didn't need it every day. I didn't, you know, but that was like, it's such an, it's just like such a quick cope to just like yeah. fix a problem. And this is not me. It, this is not us saying like, don't do you, it. You, I know. you don't, you don't not need your medication. It, it <laughs> saved, it saved my life in the university yeah. for sure. But yeah. then I thought for the rest of my life, I was going to have to take this one pill. And sometimes there's conversations you can have with your with your medical professionals to be like, what if I don't have to take it every day? Mm -hmm. and I think that's an important conversation to have. Not saying that taking the medication is bad at all, but having those conversations, just being like, do you know what? It's maybe healthier for me right now not to be on it. Totally. And I think honestly, like, you know, having my little breakdown, it was, this is why I say to people, I'm like being HIV positive is the best thing to happen to me and the worst thing to happen right. to me. Because before I was positive, before I got the diagnosis, I was like partying seven days a week. I was an absolute gong show, <laughs> but still was able to work and like do that. And I knew in my head, I was like, you need to slow down. You need to right. stop. And, and I kept saying to myself, like after this festival for work, I'm going to like, take a take a break and step back and not party as hard and and do that and it and i did obviously because of all of this and from then on i'm like you know i can't imagine where my life would be if i'd continued on that path right 
like, yes, getting HIV, like nobody wants to be like sick, quote unquote. Right. But it honestly like put so much into perspective for me because especially with my CD4 count being so low. And if I hadn't gone into the doctor, I probably within the next month or two would have been diagnosed with AIDS. And if you, if you're diagnosed with AIDS, just um, to give me a bit more context, if you're on the, if you're on the medication still, can you still be undetectable at a point? That, okay. Honestly, I'm not hundred percent sure on that. Okay. I know that, you know, back in the day, AIDS was like an absolute death sentence. Yeah. Now it's not necessarily considered a death sentence. It just means you, you have a really, really rough time. Like your, your immune system is basically knocked out. Right. You can, you can take the medication to, to live longer, but it definitely is like for me, because I'm only HIV positive, I take my medication and it bumps up my immune system to be that of a regular person right. who, who has nothing wrong with them. Right. Um, and so I'm not a hundred percent sure. I know that, you know, being diagnosed with AIDS is not what it used to be, mm -hmm. but it's still like, to say, and, 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 you know, this is my own thing I have to work through. I think saying things like I'm HIV positive versus I have AIDS mm -hmm. still holds such a weight because sure. of everything that has happened. And you know what? Like, I think it will pretty much forever be like that. Maybe not forever, but for at least a long time, because it will take a long time to get, it's one thing to get the HIV stigma down, but when you hear the word AIDS, you just assume death. And it's really hard to get people to pivot off that thought and and think about something else rather than death when you hear AIDS. And right. I, and I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I know that it's not what it used to be. For sure. And do you, do you, do you remember the moment when you kind of felt the, the acceptance of, of knowing that you, that you were HIV positive and that it was something that you were going to. Yeah. Like I, I think there's two, there's two acceptances. One mm -hmm. was when I first found out and I was like, okay, I, I can deal with this, but then obviously I had all my issues after. I had been approached to do a documentary last year for um, Much Music at MTV and Crave, which is a streaming service in Canada. And um, I had immediately said no. Right. A friend of mine had, had was going to be directing it and it was for them. And he was like, I'd love you to be a part of it. And I was like, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he just kept asking me. And it was very persistent. And finally, I met up with him and he pitched it to me. And I got kind of drunk when he told me <laughs> and was like, OK, I'll say yes right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it... It was strange because I knew that if I was going to do this, that it was going to end up being really public mm -hmm. and I would have to come out to everyone. I'd already like, it wasn't like I was hiding it. I had told like pretty much everyone in my life, right. but like my parents didn't know, my family didn't know. They all live in, in BC. I, I just didn't feel like it was necessary for them to know. Right. Especially because I got everything under control. And so I did the documentary. And honestly, it was like the best thing I could have done because it opened up so many doors. I still get messages to this day of people being like, watching this documentary like really helped me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, oh, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I just had to get really stoned before I even spoke <laughs> in this documentary. <laughs> and it was so, it was such an interesting thing because that was, I think, the true acceptance was yeah. like, it was out for the entire world to see. Right. We had to do- the same documentary that's on Crave? Yeah. What's so we it called? To, it's Sorry? called Positive. Positive. So we had to do a bunch of press for it and we had to, you know, speak on like eTalk, CP24. Mm -hmm. um, they were, they were writing about it on MTV and much music and like it, all these websites that suddenly had my photo on it as like the face of mm -hmm. HIV, which I was like, Oh God, I'm not yeah. used to like that. But it was interesting because I used to be really afraid of speaking in public. Mm -hmm. And now I'm not because I had to go out and speak to crowds about being HIV positive and tell my story. And now I'm just like, well, oh, throw something at me and I'll fucking talk about it. <laughs> do, you, <laughs> do, you, do you feel like you were scared to speak to crowds because you weren't 100% your true self. And then once, once your true self kind of was laid out on the table, it made it a lot easier for you. Cause yes and no. I think for me, like I just, I have anxiety when I'm in crowds okay. and it, it really stresses me out. And even when I was in university, like presenting projects, I'd get like so stressed uh -huh. and like, to be honest, most of the projects I did at Rarus and I usually took two or three shots before. Okay. <laughs> and would like <laughs> present them. But it, it, it's strange because I understand what you're saying. And to an extent that is it, I think, because the deepest, darkest secret that I had, even though I hadn't had that before when I was like afraid to speak in front of crowds, suddenly it's like you've laid your whole, 
soul out for the world to see it's now uploaded to a streaming service and airing on youtube and like worldwide and you kind of hit this point where you're like wow i just <laughs> there's nothing, nothing left to be afraid of right exactly like, yeah. and, it, and it's and it's kind of a crazy feeling that people know that you're hiv positive mm -hmm. before they almost even know your name or know you at, like know you at all right mm -hmm. well and a really fun thing is like in the university of toronto in the nursing program they've actually put positive as part of the curriculum so we actually mm -hmm. had to go speak um earlier this year for it and i i can't tell you how big of a difference it was to like do a screening in front of like bell media much music employees and like nursing students who are genuinely like interested in hearing it and they're like 18 and 19 too so <laughs> and they're all just like we have a million questions yeah. and you're like okay <laughs> like ask me that but it, it's led me to do a lot of work with like um aids committee toronto and and being able to share my story on a larger platform like yes maybe people have heard it before but at the same time like i hope it encourages more people to be able to feel comfortable and break that stigma and just realize there's nothing to be ashamed of like mm. you know for me it was like i didn't know who gave it to me because at the time i was so involved with work and i was like you know so busy but at the same time like i had never uh, i was partying so much and so hard the person that i did sleep with i didn't remember sleeping with mm. And they told me a year later, a year to the date that I had initially fallen sick, which is a weird like universe thing. Yeah, yeah. And it was a friend of mine and, you know, we went to dinner and they got kind of quiet and we're like, I have to tell you something, I'm HIV positive. And I was like, oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I am too. And he, uh, he just looked at me and just like got really upset at the table. And I was like, oh my God, we're in public. Like, can yeah. you not? And he was like, I've ruined your life. I've ruined your life. And he's like, I'm like, what? And he goes, well, you know, when we slept together last year and I was like, we didn't sleep to, oh. And mm. I kind of just had this like, weird like slight flashback where i was like if you had never brought that up i would have never remembered because i was so drunk right. and it just escalated from there and him and i now have a really beautiful relationship I love that. where there i i couldn't be mad at him because like he could have never told me did he did, did he say that he knew beforehand no he didn't know beforehand he oh, found okay. out a few weeks later and he knew that he doesn't live here right so he knew i had fallen sick and he admitted he was too afraid to ask me what right. i was sick with so he waited until he came back to visit and wow you know it was very uh, i it, it taught me honestly this disease has taught me a lot about like forgiveness because we he told me and I just kind of looked at him. I was like, there's no point in being angry mm -hmm. because it's not going to change anything. Right. And especially my doctor initially, when I was diagnosed, she had said to me, she's like, do you know who gave it to you? I said, no. And she said, if you don't know, let it go. Right. Because you cannot like, you will spend the next however many years dwelling on it being like, did this person give it to me? This person give it to me. And so I let go. And so when he told me, I already let all those feelings out and was like, mm -hmm. at least now I know. Mm -hmm. And I know that you are having a harder time with it than I did. Yeah. And so I almost felt a bit more protective. And so it's a really beautiful thing where it's like, you know, we both have gone through something. Yes, he gave it to me. But at the same time, like, I can't be mad because there is nothing that's going to change yeah. by me being mad. Yeah, and I think it's similar to to what that guy said to me on Grinder was just that like there's ne there was never an ill intent. Like people are not trying to hurt other people, and that like it's not you know you you had a you had a thing that changed your life now, but it's not he didn't intentionally hurt you, and he can't hold that burden. Yeah, right? and and honestly, it was a strange thing because like so. I had actually got it by topping, which mm -hmm. a lot of people assume that if you top somebody, you cannot get. Right. Apparently, HIV. what I was reading online is that the statistics show that the likelihood of getting HIV from topping is like 1% versus as a bottom, it's like 80%. Mm. So I was in that 1%. You're, yeah. you're special. Which like, yeah, fuck, I'm special as shit. Um, and so that's like kind of the thing where you realize you cannot, everything is so unpredictable and you cannot be like, oh, I did this wrong. I did this wrong. It's like, you know what? You did what you did. We make choices. We do what we do. Mm -hmm. 
we deal with what happens from it. And for me, I think HIV is the most positive thing, pardon the pun, the most positive thing to <laughs> happen to me because it, it really, it honestly changed the course of my life. Like I was a mess before mm-hmm. right? and it got me like initially when I thought I had um, mono, I was just like, okay, this is that sign that I need. And I like stopped drinking for six months. Right. was very like, I was quote unquote boring. I went to bed at like eight in the eight at night <laughs> every day, um, and really got into that sort of life where I started to appreciate things more because I was so tired all the time. Right. And then when I got the diagnosis, I was like, okay, this is even more of a a thing where I just I feel now like I am most authentically myself, which is strange. And yeah, I, you know, was dealt a hand that I don't necessarily think people want, but I also am like, okay, well, if I'm going to be dealt this hand, I might as well be able to help people with it or break, break down the stigma with it. And is there a lot of like lifestyle changes that you have like with, with like drinking and doing drugs and those kind of things that have to change when you start taking the medication? Um, I mean, I think it's different for everybody. For me, I, you know, was, was partying far too hard and decided to cut everything out. I, you know, I don't think marijuana, like marijuana for me is like a saving grace. (laughs) (laughs) Like I love marijuana. Um, I actually don't drink that heavily. Right. I drink a lot of wine, but usually like only like maybe once or twice a week. Right. Not every day as I was doing it before mm-hmm. where I was drinking like a 1.5 liter per night. Yeah. Um, and, and I just, I, I make sure I'm like, okay, I need to get full sleep. Mm-hmm. I need to, you know, be able to exercise and be able to have those things in my life that make me sane especially since i'm off that medication Mm -hmm. so there's almost like a level of care that that it gave you to yourself oh 100 percent. like before it was like i would party till four in the morning get up at 6 30 go to the gym go to work party from 5 a.m or 5 p.m till you know four in the morning again like i was just an absolute mess Mm -hmm. and now i'm like yo (laughs) 10 o'clock, do not disturb goes on my phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we'll be like that until 7 a.m. the next day. And people realize that. Like I had actually somebody tell me like maybe, I think it was after, before I was diagnosed, but when I thought I had mono, mm-hmm. somebody was like, you're so boring now. And I was like, but cool. That, that <laughs> I was, love being boring. <laughs> that was while you had like no energy? Yeah. That's rude. Cut they're like, that person off. They literally were like, oh, they're, they're gone. <laughs> they were I, like, they're like, you don't party anymore. You don't ever come out to the bar. I'm like, honestly, because like the moment midnight hits, like I'm exhausted. Mm-hmm. And it's to this day where I'm still exhausted because I am, I do consider myself a bit of a workaholic. So it's like, I do work a lot and I make sure I get up at six in the morning and I exercise and I eat healthy and I I can't just eat the crap I used to. Mm -hmm. I very much am like, you know what? This is a second chance and I'm not about to fuck that up. I'd rather be able to live a great life, a fuller life and, you know, no shade to anybody who does do that life mm-hmm. like you know eat like crap and you know can eat whatever but also like parties on non-stop if that's what you want to do great there's yeah. no judgment here because i did that for so many years i'm the party girl of the of the, of the three of us i think <laughs> definitely <Yeah. laughs> but, at the, but at the same time i'm like i myself need this because i have this thing that could potentially cut my life shorter mm-hmm. i need to make sure i live my life as long as possible and like to pivot off that really shortly it's like I, when I had said, like, I'm very, um, you know, you get into this world where everybody is expecting you to do something and you kind of get into this phase of just, you, you do what you do. Like you party nonstop, you do like all that to be suddenly thrust into a world where you don't necessarily have to do that and mm-hmm. you really can't because you have to do all the like you have to take care of yourself it it's a strange thing to be like oh wow i've been given this like this second chance to basically pivot my life back and mm. does that make sense like yeah, yeah. To, to change course and so that's why i look at hiv as this thing that like was the best and the worst thing to happen to me because when i think about like if i just continued on that path where would I be in 2020 mm-hmm. versus 2017? Yeah. And I think I'm such a different person in that, in that respect. And also like, 
I feel so um, woke. I feel really not woke. I feel blessed. <laughs> I feel really, really blessed I to be that. here. And I know that sounds like stupid, but like no, I think no, when not people, at all. well, I think when people get the the diagnosis, they automatically think I'm gonna die. Mm-hmm. And you know, I like I said, I had my little flash where I was like, you know what? If I die, I'm fine. Yeah. And now I'm like, you know what? That's fucked up. I I I want to like be able to find things like just because I achieved that list of stuff I wanted to do by the time I was thirty. Mm-hmm. I now have new things that I'm reaching for, and like yeah. especially since coming out publicly, my life has just changed so exponentially, mm-hmm. and like I've been given so many more opportunities than I thought I would have gotten had I not done that. Mm-hmm. Right. I was able to like do these talks. I was able to work on like. Canada's drag race, which is like my, like, I love yeah. drag race. And like, that to me is like the ultimate. And honestly, like, I, and I say this to like the people who hired me because I love them, but like getting to do that show just after I had like really come out publicly was the validation I needed to just soldier on like I was like yes I am the same person Mm -hmm. people are seeing me for like my talent and not for this person that you know they feel bad for right or that is sick um and that was a really nice thing was like people on set knew and treated me no different was and because it was like a queer show I felt so safe being there right. versus like when I had initially come out um, with the documentary, I was like at a place that like, you know, everybody knew I was gay, mm-hmm. but like nobody knew that. Right. And I didn't tell anybody before the documentary mm-hmm. came out and I took the day off to go do press. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden all this stuff came out and they were all like, Oh, <laughs> like it was strange. And so like, I think my life has just changed exponentially for the better since being open and being my authentic self. Can I ask you one more question? Yeah. Who won Canada's Drag Race? I can't fucking tell. I honestly, I don't even. I know. I know nobody know. knows. Well, I asked him this a thousand. Times. I know. I know nobody's going to tell me. I just was trying. He wouldn't tell me. He wouldn't I was me. trying my best. But, but I will. I I will say on that, like the people on there, like we had so many talks about me being HIV positive because of the fact that. Canada's Drag Race is produced by the same company that um, did the documentary that I worked for. And it's strange because I still felt so, even though it was out in the open, I still felt uncomfortable talking about it with people. Mm -hmm. And then people were just so open and so loving and caring and educated. And to be on a queer set, that was like the most, that was like the ultimate. Right. Because you just, you know that the people are there that are in your corner. Mm. You don't, and, and this is nothing against people who are on like a predominantly straight set um, for other TV shows, but like there is that sense of they wouldn't understand yeah. versus the queer get it. Wouldn't, yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, even if, even if we, even if we've never even been uh, close to somebody who is HIV positive, it's just like part of our community. It's like instilled into us. We're like at least have a, a base a base knowledge, just a tiny bit of knowledge very much so. that you can like be in that space and feel safe. Very much so. And like very quickly, I do think that it should be said that like, I, and I'm, this was a few years ago. I don't know if this is still the stat, mm. but it was the, the growing, the, the biggest growth in demographic for people who are HIV positive were actually females mm-hmm. age 25 to 31. And this, I cannot stress this enough. It is not a gay disease. No. You have to get tested. No matter if you are like non-binary, male, female, whatever you identify as, get tested. And I do think of a lot of it is because like it's 2020. Everybody's pretty fluid. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are just having sex with everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of... And I I don't necessarily think like... I, I think a lot of women just assume my biggest fear is pregnancy. Right. Mm -hmm. And not getting tested for HIV. And that is like, you must get tested, know your status, no matter what, no matter what orientation you are or gender or non identifying, Mm -hmm. you must get tested because it isn't just a gay disease. It's for everyone. The very first person I ever met that had HIV was my mom's best friend who uh, had a, had a drug, had a drug problem. Mm -hmm. And he, and he had a heroin problem and a person gave him a needle and was like, Hey, like the, I have, I'm HIV positive and I use this needle, but it's the only one I have. 
And because of his drug, a drug addiction, he used it and went to the clinic the next day and was like, I have HIV. I like that you brought that up. Let's, 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 um, let's, let's dabble on that before we close. Mm-hmm. Cause I like that you mentioned the fact of your first experience with HIV. Cause it mm-hmm. brought me back to mine. My very first experience with HIV, mind you, I, I've been out at least as a gay man in Toronto since I was 14. Right. Um, like I was going to pride at 14. I was sneaking into cruise and tangos at 14. <laughs> kid you not um, <laughs> my, my, my gay mother was like a drag queen there so like i would sneak in to watch my gay mother perform um but i remember my very first time meeting someone who had hiv was when i moved to windsor when i moved to windsor i had met a lot of friends in detroit and they had invited me to like this this queer kind of like group on sundays and they would have like these open conversations and every week there would be a speaker Mm -hmm. And I remember him, I'm not going to call his name, but I remember him vividly. He went up there and he started the conversation with, I am so-and-so and and I am HIV positive. And my heart sunk Mm -hmm. because mind you, at this point, I'm probably 17, 18, and I have never yet met somebody who was HIV positive. And I remember looking at him and I was like, how could someone that has HIV be so happy Mm -hmm. and look so healthy? Mm. And it was that moment that inspired me to educate myself. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And like, it's, it's strange because, you know, a lot of people pivoting off that, like a lot of people think they don't know somebody who's HIV positive, but they do. For sure. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the crazy thing. Like I, um, you know, there were a lot of people when I came out publicly that people that I'm like good friends with that came out and were like, oh, we wish we were as brave as you. This is our situation. I was like, what? Mm. <laughs> it was so crazy to me. And I think like, that's the thing with like stigma. If that stigma wasn't there, people would be more open to mm-hmm. speak about it. For sure. And, it, you know, like I said, I f- I'm very lucky to have had a very, very good support system. But there are a lot of people who don't. And I understand the loneliness that people feel in that. And it's like, you know, on top of like, you know, being gay, it's like, or being queer, you suddenly have this thing that you're going to be ostracized for by most of society if they're not educated. Right. Mm -hmm. So on top of that, it's like, like for me, I, when I got HIV, when I found out I was HIV positive, I'm like, oh my God. So I'm like a biracial queer HIV positive (laughs) person. (laughs) And like, it. And, and like, it's just so strange to think about because like, there's so many people, like when my friends came out to me as HIV positive, I was like, if you couldn't come out to me, like, who did you talk to? Right. And that like, that broke my heart. Now we're very open, but it, at the time it was just so like, it broke my heart that people felt they couldn't talk to, talk to me about it. Yeah. And, and, and I think my, uh, like what we'll end on one of my last questions is, um, what would what would you guys say to people that continue to perpetuate the stigma that HIV is dirty or HIV is a scary or that or that we have no hold on it or no way of um, of helping? Um, I'd probably just say something like, if you're so afraid of HIV, which is a chronic disease now, mm-hmm. um, are you afraid of people with diabetes? Mm. Like it, it really is so similar. It's like you, HIV, HIV people take their HIV positive people take their pills, you know, and um, people who have diabetes take insulin. Mm-hmm. It and it keeps them alive and keeps them healthy and long and happy lives. And I think in order to change the narrative of HIV, because like. I think we have a bit of a different view because we're in the queer community. For sure. The people outside the queer community, it is like a totally foreign thing to them. Yeah. I would hope that eventually it would start being taught in schools. Mm, Please. And, and I wish that like, I know that with, um, the law, you're technically, if you were HIV positive, you will have to disclose to people. Mm -hmm. Um, But I know there was a a man a few years ago who I think it was in Toronto, may have been in Montreal, but he um, slept with two women and he was HIV positive, but undetectable. And they sued him for aggravated sexual assault and he got off. 
Mm. because they proved you could not pass it on. So it wasn't aggravated sexual assault because even though he didn't disclose them and he had unprotected sex with them, it doesn't change the fact you could not pass it on. Right. So I hope that when the law catches up with the science, that they will start putting that in schools and teaching that in schools. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think to go off that point, I, I think it's great in any ways of like, if you have a kink, if you have this, to disclose those kind of things, yeah. whatever they are. But that like we, the, the way we, the nature of, of, of the dirtiness is what we need to, what we need to run away from. It's, it's just, it's just another thing that a person that, that is part of a person. It's not everything that they are. Yeah. Like, would you tell somebody who has diabetes that they're dirty? Yeah. No, it's like, no, thank no. you. So onto that. So what I would say, what I would say to someone that still is perpetuating this stigma is I would, well, I wouldn't say anything to them. Mm-hmm. I would ask them why is it that you have this fear? And Mm -hmm. I would second that question with, do you have enough information or knowledge on the topic at hand to have such a fear? Mm -hmm. And at that point, I would then tell them to educate themselves because regardless of the answer that they give me, I'm not going to be satisfied most likely enough. Um, because if you were educated, you wouldn't have such a fear in my mind. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. So, and that's the thing is, and, and, and you know what, when people are uneducated, like, especially people in like sort of people who aren't in the queer community, I can't necessarily blame them for not being educated right. because they automatically assume it mostly, I think they know that it's like a, a disease that, that um, affects everyone, mm-hmm. but it mainly is in the queer community. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you're a, you know, straight female in a monogamous relationship, why would you know about that? Right. Like, and it was the same thing when I had to come out and like very publicly and my parents found out, it was like, why would they realize that they're like nearing 70? Mm-hmm. Right. But, like they're not really going to realize like to them, they know the AIDS crisis of the eighties. Right. Yeah. Not necessarily what the science is behind that. And thank God that my um, sister-in-law is a nurse. Mm. She was actually the first person in my family that I told. And she, I told her and she was like, okay. And I was like, I need you to be there when I have to call mom and dad, because I know that they watch TV. And if they see me on eTalk talking about how I'm HIV positive, (laughs) they will lose their minds. So I need you to be there when I tell them. Mm. And thankfully she was, she was educated. My parents are now very like, Oh, it's just a a thing you live with. And I'm like, great. And like, no, like I grew up in the church. So like, that is a whole other thing in itself. Whereas like, I was very afraid to tell them for that, but they're very accepting now. And like I said, I know not everybody is, but to have those people in your corner that are educated on it, Mm -hmm. to be able to be your backup, on things because I knew I was like, I know my parents, I know exactly how they're going to react. Mm-hmm. And me saying like, I'm HIV positive to them is a whole can of worms. So I'd rather have somebody who can come in and like, who is a healthcare professional and spew facts at them mm-hmm. to have them not worry so much. Yeah. And I know not everybody has that, but like, if we can just get it put in schools, like for sure, people will fucking listen. More things about, more things about gay sex in schools. I mean, I wanted here, to know, here. I wanted to know way more about gay sex than what I learned from Brokeback Mountain. Like, let's be honest. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I was like, cause all I learned is that you didn't even, you barely had to use spit, spit. to get it in there, you know? So now I'm, I'm learning. I, I, I had a harsh like, reality when I came after, into the real world. After the eight beans, yeah, like, after, can we just? Yeah, can we just talk about how easy it was for <laughs> Jake Gyllenhaal and, and what's what's his name Heath Ledger to just like you, fucking bang it out, I've never gotten past bang it out after beans. Minutes. Pardon? I never watched the, past the first ten minutes of this movie. <laughs> I mean, it's actually a really good movie. It was, it's a really good movie. It was I really like so it. boring, but no, it's anyway. so lovely. It's well, a drama. <laughs> well, I really want to thank you, Cameron, for wait, coming. Okay. What? What? No, what? What did you want to say? I was gonna say you never said what you would say. Oh, what would I? Um, what would I say? I would say, um, do you know what? At the beginning of this episode, even when I said we were talking about HIV and AIDS, I went like, we're talking about HIV and AIDS. Like I, I had a, I, I, there is like this, there's still this like nerve, ner- like nervousness I still have about talking about mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And then I think sometimes with a lot of things we need to like bring, when we have things in the open and we're, and we have these kind of conversations like we had today, I give myself more confidence in feeling like I can talk about it and not be afraid to even like, ask people on the internet Mm -hmm. like if i'm on grinder it's okay for me to ask Mm -hmm. it's okay for me to do these things and that like 
for people that have the stigma, it's I, I think a lot of it, even for me, was out of fear, right? It's like the thing we're taught to fear exactly our whole lives as queer people is that every queer person is gonna get AIDS and die. Right. So that was my that was always my fear. And I think uh I think after you get past that fear, fear is what drives us a lot of the time. Once you get past that fear, um, you you can learn to understand. And that's my hope. Amen. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you. Do you know where, where can we find you on the Instagrams or the Facebooks oh, or anything like that? Can we find you anywhere? We get our followers to follow you. Fun fact, I don't have Facebook. Amazing. Um, I have Instagram. It's the Cameron Chase. The Cameron Chase. Yes. Um, I just wanted to do one last thing before we ended this. And I wanted to thank all of our like LGBTQ ancestors um, and survivors and people who lost their lives because of the HIV AIDS crisis and how thankful I am to be able to live the life I live now Mm -hmm. and the understanding that I have now in 2020 because of these people. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And personally, Cameron, I want to thank you because I'm like there, I'm sure there's someone listening that is either uneducated on the fact or they're going through something similar that Mm -hmm. you have went through. And at least from this conversation alone, they can see that someone with HIV can still live a normal life and that HIV is not a definitive factor to their identity. Mm -hmm. Completely. So with that, I want to say thank you. I'm Alexander Jamal, AKA King. I used to be Jamal King one on Instagram and I was like, I was an Instagram hoe. And so AKA like Jamal King one, if y'all remember bop, 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 uh this is <laughs> this is jay northcott also known as nervous shipwreck on the instagram <laughs> thank you for tuning in to barber queer episode five it's become an orgy folks we'll see you next week <laughs> bye still bye. still not original no I, I had an outro that i was gonna say do you um, i just did one well if you can't love yourself how the hell are you gonna love somebody else can i get an amen so rich so original <laughs>